I just realized um, that there were all sorts of healings that took place. If you were healed over the last weekend um, from people praying, would you just stand up? Let's just see, if you experienced like a level of healing, it went from 10 to five um, or, or better, would you just stand up? Just be brave, come on. All right, it's amazing. So there's a bunch of testimonies. Now, um, you can sit down. Thank you so much. What amazing. God touched people, healed them. If you prayed for someone that experienced healing when you were praying, will you stand up real quick? Let me see that. It's amazing. Look at that. Okay, now sit down. Great. It's amazing. It's just, so I was reflecting on this. I'm like, gosh, healings took place. Deliverance happened. People were, were literally freed from spiritual oppression last week. People experienced prophecy, words of knowledge, they experienced being filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. All, all these things happened last week, whether you know it or not. And I realized some of us have had these amazing experiences. And then there's some of us that didn't have those experiences. Anyone else here like that? Where you were disappointed. You were let down. You were frustrated. You wanted God to show up, but he didn't show up the way you expected him to show up. Anyone? Can we just be brave and... Are the, you want to stand? Do you want to be brave and just stand? Because we should honor that as much as that, the other stuff too. So I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking um, in, in the midst of that, some of you actually really maybe felt uncomfortable with Robbie, right? He's, first thing he's, he does is have you stand up and pray for healing. I haven't been a part of a church Sunday service where that happened. That was weird for me. I've done that in prayer circles, in prayer trainings. I haven't done that on Sunday. And so I realized that some of you are like, no, I, you know, I'm an introvert. I'm not gonna go pray for people like that. <laughs> you, you start questioning theology. Why doesn't God heal everyone? And I just wanted to just air it out and just say, guys, this is what church life is all about. Some of us get healed, some of us don't. Some of us doubt, some of us question, some of us aren't, aren't certain whether that's theologically accurate or not. Can we just like let all that go and say it's okay? Because the point of Robbie coming is to disrupt the norm, to focus, uh, to, to challenge us, to say that there's more to this Christian faith than just our little comfort circle of what we think is perfect. But we gotta expand our perspective. If Jesus is raised from the dead and he's Lord, if we confess that, then there's all sorts of room for different views about God. Would you agree? Can we have him at the center and work our way to figure out the rest of life and theology and faith? So the invitation is to be disrupted, to be uncomfortable, to challenge your faith, to say, no, I reject that completely, and be committed to community while other people are going, I absolutely think everyone needs to pray for healing, everyone's gonna be healed. It's okay that we have different perspectives. Is that okay? All right, so on that note, point number one, <sighs> what happens when you have a powerful encounter with God and have to go back to work on Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> we're in a series called Real Jesus. And I want to talk about, uh, I want to make some observations about the text. So this series has been about the message of Jesus, the life of Jesus, and the mission of Jesus. We've talked about his message over the, uh, the beginning of the series. And then we talked about some of his sermons, his teachings and parables. And then um, in the new year, we started moving into Jesus's life, talking about prayer, talking about Sabbath. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, a different way of just uh, taking an interaction, an encounter that Jesus had in the scriptures and just making some observations and just really landing on one point at the end um, and then inviting people to be baptized and we get to celebrate those that are getting baptized today. So that's what today's about. Are you with me? Okay, so um, we're gonna be in John chapter four. So if you have a Bible, go to John chapter four. But have you ever experienced the presence of God in your life, had a powerful encounter with God? And then, uh, and maybe it was being healed. Maybe it was a gentle whisper in a quiet, you know, and you were in solitude in the mountains. For, uh, for all my friends that love to be alone in nature, you experience God in nature. Maybe you got prayer on a Sunday morning and someone read your mail and, and you were, you, they, they spoke prophetically a word of knowledge. Uh, maybe it was on a train in India, like for me, where God whispered a thought into my head that became a virus that consumed my life that led me to move to one, from one city to another and start a church at a young age. I don't know what it was for you, but have you had an experience with God at some point in your life? A, a, a high high kind of mountaintop experience. Have we had those? 
And is it interesting, um, or, or isn't it fascinating, I suppose, that, that we have empowered weekends, and then we have to go back to work on Monday? That's the point of empowered, by the way. And I, I, one of the things I'm, I'm hesitant to keep doing conferences, why I'm hesitant to do it and why we only do it once a year is because we will find ourselves becoming looky-loos and conference people if that's where you meet God all the time. I don't want a church that just gets excited for empowered. I want a church that gets excited for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because that's where it matters, okay? So I wanna talk about how do we do spirituality when... Um, when we have to go back to work on Monday, when we're tired and hungry and thirsty, when, uh, when, we, when we have these experiences and then we have, to, we have to continue with ordinary life. You see, the problem with the word spirituality in our English definition is that it stems from Greek thought. And, and the word implies um, spirituality is a separate place than the material world. In the Greek thought, there's the material world and then there's the spiritual world. And so material is the mundane, the physical, earth, our bodies. And then the spiritual is the elevated thought and, and spirits and it's disconnected. Now, that's unhelpful because in Hebrew thought, um, Hebrew thought, there, there's no word in classical Hebrew for spirituality because the Jews believe that there's just one good, beautiful world that involves the spirit and the physical. So the material and the spiritual are together. In other words, everything is spiritual. So how do we approach life with that perspective? Um, here's one more th thought before we jump in, because I wanted to share with you um, I, what I believe is that um, God only meets you where you are. God never meets you where you aren't. Okay, this is... It sounds like Dr. Seuss, but um, this, is, <laughs> this is so important for us as we talk about our lives, our spiritual journey. God only meets you where you are. God never meets you where you aren't. Have you ever noticed that? That in life, um, if we live our lives expecting for God to meet us on the mountaintops, we'll miss the opportunities that, for God to meet us in our ordinary lives. So it, it, when, when I have an encounter with God, it's usually experience where I am in that moment, okay? I'm not where I was or where I'm going, but it's right now. You with me? And so we have to include a spirituality that has the mundane, the material, the ordinary, the Monday commute. Are you with me? Okay, so Jesus is really good at, at, at this stuff. So I wanna jump into the text. John chapter four, verse three. It's a very familiar story. So let's just look at this story. I'm gonna make some observations and we'll land with baptisms. Okay, so Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. Verse three. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, listen to this, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? In parentheses, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Couple of observations about this before we keep going. First of all, it says he had to go to Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. Now, a, a good Orthodox Jew would go around Samaria. Okay, it would add a few days on the journey because the Jews, in case you haven't been here when we've talked about this, they hated the Samaritans. The Samar it was an ancient revival, uh, revival ancient, um, <laughs> what is it? Rivalry, <laughs> right? And they hated each other. It would be uh, like the Bloods and the Crips. It would be like the Panthers. And what's the other team again? Just kidding. I know. Come on. And the Broncos on Super Bowl Sunday. It would be like Al-Qaeda and the Tea Party. I mean, it was, they, 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 <laughs> they hated each other. I mean, and, it, and they believed they were spiritual heretics. They took um, Jewish practices and they, they mixed them up with other religious practices and worshiped other gods. So it was ancient um, hatred. And so the Jews would never interact with the Samaritans. They would go around there. So Jesus goes through Samaria. And so he had to go through it. And it's basically his pit stop. It's his, it's his restroom break. 
okay? It's, it's his Barstow trip on his way to Las Vegas or whatever, whatever it is, Barstow, you know, so uh, forgive me. Uh, or, or, you know, it's that stop on your way up to Northern California. What's that stop? Kettleman City. It's like you stop. It's a rest area and for a bigger destination. Are you with me? And so Jesus um, is, is tired. Listen to this, though. I want to make this observation. Jesus was hot because it was noon in the desert. He was th- uh, tired, thirsty, and hungry. Okay, so I just want to make this point. He was hot, tired, thirsty, and hungry. If I'm one of those four, I'm a mess. In f- <laughs> true story, yesterday, um, I was at Target, and then we went to um, Trader Joe's to get some groceries. It was about 10 a.m., And uh, uh, my wife says something to me about the type of nuts that I was purchasing. They had a little too much sugar for the healthy selection. And she said something and I got offended and I said something back. And she's like, well, I'll just let you finish shopping then and left me and Ezra to go. And she's like, I'm gonna go on a nice stroll outside. And I I was off on that. And then I'm, I'm realizing as I'm checking out, why did I say what I said? And I realized I skipped breakfast. And I am a child that throws a tantrum when I don't have food in my stomach. So if I'm tired, thirsty, or hungry, or hot, I'm gonna be a mess. But notice this, Jesus is all four of those things on his way to a destination and is open and available to God. All right, so this is what happens. Um, Jesus uh, then goes on and he says, um, I gotta make sure I'm where, no, I've got one more point before that. So <laughs> this is not next. So um, one point I wanna make about this observation is that where you are matters. And everywhere you are matters. Everywhere you go matters. Everywhere you are matters because it's a potential place for God to interact with you and other people. Are you with me? It could be on your way Uh, to someplace else. And I want you to think about that. I just want you to pause just one second because of this. Um, Some of you are here and you're you're in a transition place in your life. You're waiting for the job to come in. You're waiting to finish school. And you keep saying, you're waiting to find that spouse. And you keep saying, I'll do this thing for God once I get here. But everywhere you are now already matters because it's a place for God to use you for his kingdom, to use you to bring life, to use you to expand heaven on earth, to use you to to speak his words to desperate people. So when you go to the coffee shop on your way to work, that matters. Are you with me? Now, most of us have a self-focused type of spirituality in Christianity. It's all about me and my Jesus calling, my little latte, and, my, uh, and I, I, te- I keep bashing Jesus calling. It's great, use Jesus calling. But it's, it's about you and your spirituality, and it's about your close little neat group of friends that look like you, talk like you, act like you. You don't live outside of yourself. It's become this, this uh, you can have a, a particular style of worship that you have a preference for. And so when those songs come on at church, you, you sing those, but the other songs you don't sing. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, you, I mean, literally, you could say, oh, you read NIV, I read ESV. And there, there's this, this Christian thing that goes on. And, and I want to just say that that's just heresy. It's idolatry. It's that significant. It has never been you, yourself, and Jesus. It's always you and Jesus in the whole world and the nations. So everywhere you go, you represent the king. And when you're self-focused and depressed and going through difficult seasons, it just becomes this internal focus. And I can't tell you how many times on Sunday morning, I'm so focused on my sermon and this anxiety that I have that I just miss an opportunity, excuse me, opportunity. This is why we blocked off the front row. (laughs) We miss an opportunity. I've missed the opportunity to be a joyful presence for the early morning shift at Starbucks. You with me? Okay, everywhere you are matters. Um, Okay, now, let's read the next part of the story. Oh, I didn't realize that I was gonna get into this sermon like I am, and I'm very thankful for John 4 and the ability to preach this morning. Uh, John 4, 9 says this, the Samaritan woman said to him, did I miss something? No, okay, said to him after this, whew, Uh, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask 
me for a drink, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and, um, and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. Is that an amen? Amen. I, okay, I thought I heard amen. That was just me in my head. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Amen. amen. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I, don't, I won't get thirsty and I won't have to keep coming out here to get some water. Oh, it's so good, this story. So he's, he's talking about eternal things and she's like, I don't wanna come back to this well. I'm tired of going here. Here's something that you need to know. Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. So a Samaritan woman represents the morally corrupt, the uneducated, no power, no privilege. Um, Samaritans, Jews never associated with the Samaritan. Uh, Rabbis would never associate with women. Now a Jew, and this is interesting, a a Jew, a a Jewish rabbi would never even speak spiritual things to their Jewish daughters because it was pointless and worthless according to rabbinic tradition. And the previous story is Nicodemus, a Pharisee that um, is part of the ruling class. He's educated, he's wealthy, he's a, a Jewish aristocrat, and Jesus talks about spiritual things with him. And now the very next story is this woman who's excluded. And, and it says that she comes at noon. And what that means is that she was publicly shamed by the rest of the community because for a woman to draw from the well at noon meant that she's not going when you would go in the morning and in in the evening with other women together in community. She's doing it alone in isolation. Something happened to her, which we'll find out in a little bit, that made her publicly disgraced to the rest of the town. And Jesus has this interaction, talking about living water, talking about life, talking about never being thirsty again. And Jesus breaks down the social barriers. Jesus breaks down um, the stereotypes, the religious stereotypes, the the moral stereotypes of who Christians should or non-Christians be associated to. Are you with me? He breaks down the barriers. He builds bridges to people that are hurting and broken and lost. Because everyone you encounter matters because they matter to God. Everyone you matter, everyone you encounter matters because they matter to God. Every person you come in contact with is an opportunity for you to see a child of God that needs the Father's love and blessing. Do you have capacity in your life to extend that type of view, that type of relationship with God that you have, that type of perspective for the rest of the world to experience? Because this is the point. The movement is when the church gets it, it's released everywhere. So everyone you encounter matters because they matter to God. And so Jesus doesn't care about her influence, doesn't care that she's immorally, uh, immoral, immoral or unschooled or that she's an outcast. He builds bridges to build a relationship and then talks about living water, which was an Old Testament metaphor for God's grace, um, for God, the knowledge of God, for his salvation. Talks about streams of living water flowing up. That's eternal life. Remember, he's not saying, hey, I wanna talk to you about what happens when you die. He's talking about life that is really life. Eternal life is is John's way of talking about the kingdom of God. This is what the way God intended life to be in the first place. You in right relationship with God, you have right relationship with yourself and right relationship with community. That's eternal life. That's what eternal life is is supposed to look like. And Jesus offers it to this woman. Um, And then he goes on, he says, verse 16, he goes, uh, hey, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. You you don't have a husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you are now with is not your husband. What you said is quite true. And then Jesus has her. Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Okay, time out. 
No more of that. <laughs> Our ancestors worship on this mountain. And have you ever had an encounter? I do this. It happens to me all the time. Because now she starts talking about spiritual things. And so people, they'll be cussing in front of me at a restaurant and they say, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, and they're like backtracking in their mind all the sin they just performed in front of me. And <laughs> it's like, that's what she does. She's like, okay, wait, okay. There's something about this mountain that we worship on, talking about a theological debate, and, um, it, which was an ancient debate. They, they worshiped on a different mountain than the Jews. They built a separate temp, uh, temple than the Jews built. Um, and Jesus says, look, 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 woman, I, uh, believe me, a time is coming when, the, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. I wanna just say that again. They're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. This is completely separate. I'm stepping out of the sermon. I believe for us to go where we're going next, we need three things in this church that are embodied in everyone, everyone that calls the garden home. We need to be worshipers, number one. First, and that's the number one priority on your life is to be a worshiper. To have songs coming out of your heart and through your mouth and your head for the world to hear. When you wake up, joy and thanksgiving are on your lips. I just was, uh, the other day, I was talking to my two-year-old son right before we went down. I said, what are you thankful for? He has no idea what I'm asking. So we start modeling it. God, I'm, you know, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for this home. You know what he said? Applesauce. It's so awesome. <laughs> but he's becoming a worshiper. <laughs> we need to be worshipers. Second, we need to become people of prayer. Some of you are like, yeah, God bless applesauce. <laughs> the second thing was cheese. So, uh, yeah, anyways. My sweet boy. Um, the second thing is prayer. We need to become people of prayer and not just praying on Sundays. We need to become intercessors. Prayer, I got a text message from a friend on my way here and he just, he highlighted that revival will begin when we become people that pray, pray, pray. And the third thing is faith. And what I mean by that is, is what Robbie talked about specifically. Faith spelled R-I-S-K, stepping out in our life, stepping out of what's ordinary, stepping out of our comforts and moving forward in in the world, and so we need, we need to become worshipers, we need to become prayer warriors, and we need to be, become people of faith. So this woman, um, or Jesus says, we worship God in the spirit of truth. Um, the woman said, I, uh, and then he says, God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And listen to what the woman says. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. What's so profound about this text, and I get moved every time I read it, is she's a Samaritan woman. She doesn't deserve anything. Jesus just talked to Nicodemus, the head of the Pharisees, the spiritual leader of the Jewish community at the center of the Jew, this most spiritual city, in the center of the, you know, the, the nation that's holy and set apart, and it's a Samaritan outcast woman with no, nothing good in her body. She's not spiritual. She's had five husbands, and Jesus says, I am the Messiah. Do you see how loving this God really is? He breaks down barriers. He breaks down uh, heresy. This would have been seen as heresy. And he says, I am he. Why wouldn't he declare his messiahship to everyone else, but he does it to the Samaritan woman? How kind is our God? He meets her right where she's at. He meets her in her lowliness. And God elevates her. It's amazing. I love it. She responds. Okay, so let me just talk about this. So she responds for the need of water. Give me some water. And he says, bring your husband back. And, then this, and, and I just wonder, how did Jesus know that she had five husbands? You ever think about this? Now, what we do in this text is we say, well, he was God. Therefore, he just knew everything. Now, but let me just highlight an observation. He was hot, tired, hungry, and thirsty full humanity right in front of us. How did he know? I believe, I'm just gonna submit this to you, that it was a word of knowledge. Jesus did everything he did on earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he empowers the church to do everything he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a perfect example of what we were talking about last week, what we called power evangelism. 
that in this moment, Jesus is revealed something by the Holy Spirit. God reveals something to him and he suggests something to her. Go get your husband. He's sen- sensitive, he's gentle. What do, you, what do you think he saw when he was talking to this woman? You wanna know what I think he saw? Loneliness, isolation, pain, brokenness. A woman who is thirsty and filling her life with everything else that would never satisfy. Are you with me? You can all grow in words of knowledge. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Because how do you, how, what Jesus does is he's sensitive, he's gentle, he offers this word of knowledge to her, and then all of a sudden it opens up a different conversation. She, she, he read her mail, basically, and she's trying to figure out what to do now. When I was at Laundry Love of months ago, this is almost a year ago, I've shared this story, but we were with a few of us and we were talking to this one girl. She was not a Christian. I've shared this story before. But as we prayed for her, I had this feeling and sense that I've learned to trust over the years um, that something had happened to her when she was a child and that nobody believed it in her life and that marked her life. So that's, that's a thought I've, I've had. Now, now, how do you tell that to a stranger, right? Because that's a serious that's a very serious thing. She's a stranger. She's not a Christian. She, doesn't, she believes in the stars and being a good moral person is what she said. And so I'm in there praying and I've now learned to just be a fool in, so, in some settings. And I, I thought a laundromat was perfect to be a fool. So I, I just said to her after we were done praying, I said this, this is gonna sound so crazy and strange. I just preface it like that. I didn't say, thus saith the Lord. Oh, I've got this, <laughs> I've got this thing for you. Are you getting, or whatever it is, you know? And <laughs> Boom, and like, that's not how we do it <laughs> at all in this church, okay? We, we, <laughs> I just referenced Street Fighter and, and uh, bless you, Jesus. Thank you. Okay, so um, he has a word of knowledge. So there I was, and I just said, this is gonna sound strange. And I just said, I just have the sense that something, you could tell me if I'm wrong, stop me if I'm wrong, but something happened to you when you were a child she immediately starts crying. And then I said, nobody believed it, and it marked your, the rest of your life. And her first words, as she begins to weep, how did you know this? I said, I didn't know this. Jesus knows this, and he wants you to know him. And she gave her life to Jesus in the laundromat. Now, words of knowledge are really helpful for power evangelism. What Robbie was asking us to do last week, I'm just reflecting, was um, a little more risky, all right, it's stepping out. It's, Robbie sees a broken leg on the street and he prays for healing, okay? I, um, and and that's, that's, that's an amazing step that I hope all of us have that type of faith and we move that direction. But some of you are way back here like, hey, pray for people. I don't even wanna pray out loud, you know? Do you, am I right? Are we okay? And so some of us are like, uh, spiritual gifts, I'm totally open. I wanna learn them. I have a friend who is in a small group and, and he, his, his group of friends are praying for the gifts, right? And so then I said, well, are you practicing the gifts? Because that's where it all comes for me. It's, there's no point on praying for God to give you something that's for being given away. Okay, so I want the gift. What for? Just to have it? No, the gifts are for being exercised in community. Is, are you good? So uh, I said, hey, pray for the guests and then go out and start praying for people. That's the only way, or pray for each other. That's the only way your group are gonna experience any of these things you want, prophecy, words of knowledge, all those things. You have to step out and exercise the gifts. Come to our prayer training if you wanna learn more about this. Um, So some of you are here, and this is where it started for me, this journey of learning the spiritual gifts. It really became, hey God, I wanna pray for people. Would you give me words of knowledge so that I can go pray for people. Because as soon as I learned how to have that, then the, the evangelism piece is so easy. I read this woman's mail. How did you know this about me when nobody believed it when I was a young kid? And now her child has experienced that. She has grown up kids. And she's grieving that. And I just said, Jesus has known this whole time. He wants, and we processed that and she gave her life to Jesus. But I grew in this, and this is how you grow, by, by exercising the gifts and in, in, in praying for people. And then, when you do have a sense, share it, okay? Is that, is that helpful? So I want our church to grow in the spiritual things. You gotta learn how to grow in words of knowledge. It's way easier to pray for somebody when you have a word of knowledge than to do what Robbie does, which is trust God to fill, uh, fill your mouth. That's scary as heck. Um, and I'm, I don't, I'm doing it like occasionally, but I'm not really, I'm, I'm learning, okay? So I'm struggling. You with me? Okay, this is a bunch of observations. Um, Jesus was naturally supernatural. We are to be naturally supernatural. Does that make sense? 
he discovered that she, needed, she had five husbands um, through the, the power of the Holy Spirit, so he was naturally supernatural. Um, let me make this next point about this subject. Love always wins. Love is the ends, and love is the means to the ends. Love is evangelistic always. Love always wins. What do I mean by this? Jesus was, uh, was calling out something very personal in this woman's life. Would you agree? Called out sin in some, some circles, you know, and the church will call that sin. But he didn't just do that for the sake of speaking truth in love. He loved her. And he wanted her to experience all that life had for her. And when you encounter people, the goal is not for them to be healed. The goal is them, for them to have a loving relationship with God. The goal is for them to feel loved by God through your presence. Love is always the end. Love is always the means. Love is always evangelistic. I guarantee if you just postured yourself, postured yourself in a loving direction towards people, people would come to Jesus through your presence. Can we just say that? Is that helpful? Okay, that was just my observation about this because uh, one more point, where does Jesus meet her? Right where she is getting water, hungry for intimacy with a man, longing for something deeper, and Jesus meets her right where she's at, in her brokenness, in her pain. He doesn't say, okay, get your life together and follow me. He says, go grab your husband, let's keep talking. Is that cool? Okay, Um, and then a couple more observations on this one. Uh, Jesus revealed who he was as the Messiah. And, and this is what I really, one of the points I really wanted to make is that Jesus is water for the thirsty, not wine for the connoisseur. You'll, you'll hear this in our church a lot because this is the type of Jesus that we worship here, that Jesus is not interested in you becoming really good at being Christian. He's interested in you learning who he really is and reorienting everything in your life around him. And for those of us that have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, for those of us that have really encountered this resurrected savior of the world, for those of us that get that his heart and message is for the whole world, it's not just for our cozy comfort Christianity, but that his heart is for the lost, the broken, the marginalized, the morally corrupt, the bigots of our society. When you get that Jesus, your life changes. Your life becomes overtaken, it becomes hijacked by Jesus' life. And that's what this day is all about. Baptisms are for those of us that say, Jesus is Lord, he's raised from the dead. That changes the entire cosmos, that changes my entire life, it changes what I wanna do with my resources, it changes my behavior, it changes my relationships, it changes my dreams, my aspirations, my family life, it changes everything because he's water and I'm thirsty and I want living water. And when you realize that, when you realize after you've struggled to fulfill everything inside of you, after you've, you, you, you've gone after wealth, after global enterprise, after sexual relationships, pleasure, after you've consumed as much as you can, after you've bought as many things as you can buy, as you learn that your identity is found empty without Christ, when you discover that you come to the, to the end of yourself and realize that nothing on earth will satisfy you except the living water who is Jesus, then you get into the water in a middle school at 9.45, 10.30 in the, in the morning and you say, I believe that he's been raised from the dead and he is Lord and you go in and then you learn to live your life after him and for him. Are you with me? Yeah. Jesus is water for the thirsty. Jesus is water for the thirsty and so let's, let's just repent of our Pharisaism. Let's repent of all of our religiousness, Right? Let's repent from our, our way, our, the way that we've kept certain kinds of people out of this beautiful life-giving community because of their lifestyle preferences, of their, their, their understanding of themselves because of their views. And let's put Jesus right at the center and say, what would he do? There's no greater way to participate in the story of God than to, than to share your story of God with others. Your story is an invitation for others to encounter God. 
John 4, 39 says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, because of her story. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay and with them, uh, stay with them, excuse me, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, although they did believe because of that. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Your story, your story is an invitation for others to encounter God. Are you sharing your story? 